Hey family, it's Travis and Jackie. Hey guys. We are the pastors of Fort City Church. I believe this message you're about to watch is gonna be a game changer yes. for you. Get your notepads out, get your appetite stirred. <laughs> God has something to say to you in the right place at the right time. Listen, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell icon to get notifications for when we go live, all the good stuff. We yeah. wanna make sure that you also share this message with a friend. Everybody. If it touches your life, make sure you share it with everybody you know. No doubt, we love you, we'll see you soon. Come on, man. Yo, I'm excited. I'm excited. This is Resurrection Sunday, Forward City. One service all around the world. East Coast is 9 a.m. West Coast is 6 a.m. Nigeria, London is 2 p.m. Wherever you are, man. God is here, and we're so excited about it. We are here live from Grace Life Church in Columbia, South Carolina. My dear friend, Pastor Jimmy Current, his amazing wife and staff and family are letting us set up camp here while we are under construction at Two Knots. And we're so excited about it. It is coming along, man. I'm, I'm pumped, man. I'm like a little kid. Uh, even when I'm traveling, I'm calling uh, Mr. David. I'm like, man, what's going on? How's it going? And so we're moving, and we got all our permits, so we are ready, guys, to really get to some real, really get some real stuff accomplished. So we're so pumped. Thank you, guys, for your constant prayers um, for that. It is working. And so I'm excited. Um, I, I do have a word from God today. Before I, I jump in, let me also just recognize, you saw a few moments ago on the screen, but my, my bride, my baby mama, my girlfriend, my favorite human, Dr. Jackie. Come on, give God a praise for her. Yeah. And she just does so much, but she does so much well. She's just an amazing woman. And, um, and so I'm excited, man. Easter for me, uh, how many of y'all have Easter traditions growing up? You did Easter a certain way? No, Keisha was like, no. you did? You went to church on Easter? Easter Baptist. No, that don't count. Um, <laughs> but we would always spend Easter in Myrtle Beach, the True Way Holiness Baptist Church. It's not a Baptist church, True Way Holiness Church. I don't know where Baptist came from. And um, we, would, we would do Easter egg hunts and all of that fun stuff. But I love Resurrection Sunday. It is the greatest day in history. If not for this day, man, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. And so this is the day that believers observe what Jesus did um, over 2,000 years ago on a cross in an empty tomb. And so I'm going to take the next few moments and I'm going to really try the best uh, that I can to explain to you why this day is so important uh, to our body um, of believers. But before I do that, let's pray together if you don't mind. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day you've made. Thank you, Father, that you have changed us radically. Holy Spirit, you've done a work that only you can get the credit for. And we love you, we give you praise for it. I pray that here in the next few moments that you would speak to our hearts. You would transform us from the inside out. Thank you, Father. As a matter of fact, I just prophesy to those watching around the world, they're about to enter a season of resurrection. And things that were once dead are coming to life again. Marriages that were once dead, uh, dreams that were once dead, ideas that were once dead are being raised to life again. And I thank you. The Bible says that the power that got Jesus up, on, it's in us. Yes, it man, that's dangerous. We receive it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Do me a favor. Give them good 10 seconds of a loud praise on your way to your seats. Come on. You can take your seats. You can take your seats. I'm going to read um, from John. That's where we're going to start. We're going to kind of jump around. But John chapter 20 is where uh, I started uh, for this study. And I want you to read this with me. Here we go. It says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? <laughs> they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And it's so cool. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. That's all I had to do was call her name. 
She turned toward him and cried in Aramaic. It's one of my favorite languages I speak often. Right. Rabboni, and Rabboni means in Aramaic. Aramaic. <laughs> it means teacher. Um, so I'm excited about the story of resurrection because it gives all of us hope. And uh, many of you all may know or may not know, I've done a lot of traveling in my day. I've been really around the world. I've, I've, my wife and I were trying to calculate how many states I probably haven't been to. It's only a handful. Uh, so I've been around this country and I've been around several other countries. My passport is stamped all the way up. Uh, the first four years of my life were in Germany. Um, so as soon as I was born up north, we moved to Germany. And so I lived there for four years. But we traveled all over the place. And one of my first international trips as an adult, I'll never forget it. It was 14 years ago. I was invited by my mentor uh, to go over to Africa. So we went to Ghana. Now, the irony in all of this is a few months later, I'll meet my Ghanaian wife here in America at Georgia Southern University. So God was lining it up. Um, but I didn't go to fancy Africa. Before I really tell you about the story, let me just, let me just give this disclaimer. I love Africa. It's my favorite continent um, other than North America. I love Africa. I love the food. I love the culture. I love the passion. I love how they love. I love how they do ministry. Um, they really put, the way that they worship God put us here in America to shame, honestly, many parts of America. So I really love uh, Africa. It's, it's, it's amazing. But this trip was not amazing. One of the reasons this trip wasn't amazing because over and over we found ourselves in unsafe situations. Now, I don't think you really understand when I say unsafe. I'm talking about guns and stuff. Like, like really super unsafe. One thing, there was this guy, and I, you know, I'm, y'all know I'm just candid. I believe in being open. There was a guy, he was like a, a captain missionary man. And uh, so this, this guy, he was in Charles. And, and, and I mean, you could just see, you know, if you saw him, you would know. Okay, this is probably not going to go well. So he had this idea, Roberta. He said, hey, we're going we're to go to this remote village. It sounds good in the car. It was like, oh, man, this is good. He was like, we're going to go to this remote village, and, and God is going to use this, and we're going to dig wells. And we was like, oh, man, that sounds, you know, I think I saw that on TV. Let's do that. Uh, so we pull up. We're in this, like, Scooby-Doo van, and we pull up to this remote village. I'll never forget. And we get out. And we walk to it, and there's this tent, and it's just like lion fur everywhere. And we walk into this tent, and I, I mean, I immediately feel like this is probably it. Like, I'm just getting, catching images with my eyes because this is the last thing I'll see on this side of eternity. I'm like, okay, got it, got it, got it. This is it. Guy standing there with a gun, doesn't feel good. We walk in, and have you ever been around someone who's supposed to be in charge, but but then you see them get nervous. That's a bad feeling. I wouldn't, like I was semi-nervous, but when I saw him nervous, I got really nervous. I said, oh, we finna die. <laughs> we walk in, there's a chief. The chief of this village, this is a true story. He's sitting on the floor. And there's people around him with guns. And a bunch, it's just women, like young teenage women just everywhere. And like walking in and out of the house. And one of the guys is like, yeah, those are all his wives. I said, yo, we finna die. And so uh, the, the captain missionary man walks in, and he's, he's nervous, and he says, we, we come in peace. Why do you change your voice when you speak to people who don't speak English? <laughs> and this joke was country. We, we come in peace. And then there's a translator who, who translated it for him, and then he said, he was like, you know, we, we don't want anything. We don't want anything. He said, or whatever, you know the way they said it. And then it was like, we, we want to dig wells. We want to dig wells. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said, we just want to be a blessing. He said, you do all this. And I'm, I mean, y'all, I'm a nervous wreck. I mean, I got butterflies in my stomach. I'm thinking about my mom. I'm thinking about my sisters. I'm thinking about any sin. Sin, sin, and I'm, God, purify me. You know how you do before you take communion? And you just say a quick, God, and you know, help me. I don't want to go to hell for taking this. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, God, if there's anything in my heart, anything on my mind, anything on my Facebook, anything, God, just watch me, make me over before I die. And I'm standing there, and I look like I'm about to die. Like, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, the guy at least had on a, a, a flea market dashiki. So he looked, Captain, Captain Missionary looked like, you know, a missionary. Hey, y'all, I had on, <laughs> I'll never forget, I had on a long, um, this is back in 2007. So I had on a long white, uh, white shirt and some Air Force Ones. And I'm standing there, I look like a drive-by <laughs> victim. And I said, this is, this is probably, this is probably the end 
of my robe. Y'all, I can't make this up. This is a true story. It's a true story, Jamie said. This is a true story. So I don't know if there was a signal, if the man, if the chief did something to like signal for our execution. Something happened to make Captain Missionary Man even more nervous. Y'all, this is a true story. And he looks around, and it's a few of us. It's, I mean, my mentor, Pastor Clark, y'all know he preached here before. He's standing there, and there's other people standing. I don't know out of everybody. This is a true story. This man, I guess he had one last spade to throw down before we died, and, and, and he just turns to me. And in front of the chief, the chief is sitting there, and I don't know if he went like this. He did something to make this man nervous. And the man says, hey, hey, he's Travis, and he sings. I'm standing there looking like a crip. Anyway, I'm like, <laughs> like, what would make you choose me out of the crowd? So they like, come, come, come. So I have to walk up, y'all. This is a true story. I said, I'm, I'm about to die. And all I can think is like Game of Thrones, like Macbeth, you know, Lord of the Rings. And I know that with kings, you, if you don't make them smile, you're dead, right? Off with his head. So he's like, he sings, he sings. And the translator is like, sing, sing. <laughs> Save, save yourself. So I'm standing there. I'm telling y'all, I look like Westside. I'm standing there, and like, I don't, this is 14 years ago, so there is no, there's no Nara Dinar. There's no Imela. I don't know no African songs, y'all. I'm fresh out of college. I'm standing there. The only semi-African lyric I could think of, this is a true story, it's Kumbaya. <laughs> Guns. <laughs> Chief, virgin, teenagers, just... And me standing there in off and, and Air Force One. Y'all, I gave that song everything I had. It was if I'm gonna go out, I mean I went one yeah, boys and men, kumbaya my love. Kumbaya. I gave them all of that. <laughs> and what happened? <laughs> I gave them all of that. And what happens <laughs> is the chief. The chief likes it. And he's like, yes, kumbaya, yeah, yes. Yes, kumbaya, yes. So we made it out. We survived, needless to say. God was good to us. Here's, here's what happened. The reason I'll never forget this trip in particular, I've had a lot of them, is because I've never been on a trip where I was so eager to get back home. I said... And you know, when I'm thinking home, I wasn't thinking about possessions. I'm thinking about the people that I love and that I miss. I, I would have paid anything to get back. I would have done anything just to get back to those I love. Got a word from God on this resurrection Sunday. Simply called finding my way back home. Finding my way back home. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He has this big plan, and so he speaks everything into existence. What a mighty God. He speaks water, you know, oceans, literally. He speaks mountains. He speaks the galaxies. He speaks fish and birds and animals. The Bible is very descriptive of everything that he's doing. But all of a sudden, something shifts. Something happens. And he decides, because God is a decision maker, he decides to get his hands involved. And he says, let us make man in our image. What happens is God gets in the dirt, in the dust, and forms man. I had this thought, Marlon. The first time God deals with man, he gets his hands dirty. Which tells me something. It doesn't matter what I do in life. God doesn't mind getting his hands dirty. <laughs> God will meet you, the old people you say, if you have to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up. God will reach you where you are. He's not intimidated by your mess. As a matter of fact, he's drawn to your weakness because the Bible says, in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. So he speaks in Genesis 1, 26. He says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion, watch the Bible, over all the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth. What else is creeping thing you going to do? Every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Three things happen here with man. Watch. He says, let us make them in our image, one. Let us make them in our likeness, two. 
and let us give him dominion. Now, we're familiar with the first two, image and likeness, but dominion is a powerful thing uh, because what this means literally is that we're created by God in his image and in his likeness to dominate. The word dominion means rulership. It means authority. It means that God created us to be managers of the earth and all of his resources. It's his original intent for mankind. God, he says, I'll dominate heaven. Mankind, you dominate earth. Let us give them dominion. It's a gift. So we don't dominate people. We dominate resources. Miles Monroe breaks this concept down better than anyone I ever met. I mean, this guy, he, he gets the kingdom and he gets the subject. And one of the things that he, he talks about as far as, like, having dominion, he says your, your giftings uh, is the areas that you should dominate. It's the areas that you should have, uh, should be your domain. And that leaders don't have to pursue followers, but, but followers will always be attracted to true leaders because, because leaders have learned to master the area, the gifting of their domain. We created to dominate. So something else happens, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. But the Bible says, Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put man and he formed. Now the Lord, watch this, plants a garden, and then he plants the man in the garden. So he prepares a place, and then he plants man in it. Now, you can't just skip over this without recognizing that God always plants you in a prepared place. <laughs> so if God decides for you to go somewhere or be in something or be in, a, in an area or an environment, he has prepared it for you. And some of us are delaying on things because of fear, over being timid, over waiting for someone else's opinion, and there's a prepared place that's waiting on you to show up to it. There's a prepared place. He plants a garden in Eden. He plants a garden in Eden, and he plants man in the garden. And this, for mankind, was home. Man was given a home to be fruitful, to multiply, the Bible says, and to dominate, called Eden. Now, the word Eden is interesting. It has several meanings, but two of them I want to bring out. One of the meanings, the definitions of Eden is presence. Another definition for Eden is open door. So Eden is more than just a physical location. Maybe this is why no archaeologist can still find it to this day. Eden is not just a physical location. Eden was an environment where the presence of God was accessible, where it settled in. So really, wherever Adam went was Eden. <laughs> and so God plants a garden in an environment of his presence, Eden. Genesis 2, 15 through 17, this is interesting. The Bible says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Now watch this. It says, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free. I always get stuck right here whenever I read in the scripture because it's so powerful. He says, you are what? Free. Free to eat from any tree in the garden. So God prepares this place. He plants Adam in it. Follow the scripture. He, he plants Adam in it, and he says, he says, hey, here's a prepared place. Here's, here's a man that I'm going to place in a prepared place, and now I'm giving you freedom. Freedom. Not regulations. Sometimes when we think of this story, we think of the regulations. But he really had freedom. Now he gives him one, just one thing. Verse 17. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. It's so interesting. God not only provides freedom for all, but, but one tree. He also provides freedom, hear me, for man to make a decision. God is a decision maker. So if we're made in his image, okay, we have a body. We funk, okay. If we're made in his image, then we're not made in the image of an animal. We're made in the image of God. Cool, I get that. But if we're made in his likeness, that means that God has given us the ability to make decisions. 
So without free will of making a decision, man is no longer man. So many people get hung up on this theologically. They, they get hung up on this asking, well, why, why if everything was perfect, why would, God, uh, why would God put a tree in the garden and tell them not to eat of the tree? Because if man don't have a choice, man is not man. Because without the ability to make a decision, you're not in the likeness of God. Which makes the love of God, I don't mean to take a commercial break right here, but which makes the love of God so amazing? The fact that he don't have to choose us, but he does. Oh, man. The fact that we give him options to leave us, but he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The fact that other people will walk away, but God will stay and say, no, 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 no. I love you too much to give up on you. He makes a decision about us. And he gives us the ability in his likeness to make a decision about him. So Have you, you know, some people say, well, why, why was there room? Have you ever stopped to consider the opposite? Uh-oh. Like the fact that there is only one tree off limits. Like it's one thing if every single tree is off limits and there's only one you can eat from Adam. No, it's the opposite. There's only one. Why is it off limits, Adam? Because it will limit you. Because Adam never knew what good and evil was until he obtained knowledge of it by eating the one thing off limits. So growing up, I'm a church boy is all I know. That, I mean, every Sunday, I'm one of those, you know, literally, I can count the Sundays, COVID, that I've not attended church in my life. I mean, I'm, I'm just, that's all I know. One thing that was very popular in the 90s, how many people grew up in the 90s, or you was existing in the 90s? Anybody? You was alive during the 90s. Um, that's how you know you're getting old, when you got people who, like, I wasn't even born in the 90s. Man, yeah, you're up there. Do you know that some NBA players weren't born in the 90s? You are up there, Pastor Marvin. Um, but in the 90s, <laughs> one, one popular thing for all of us to do down south in Georgia was there, there was a hangout. It was almost like a club. It wasn't a club, but it was almost like a club. You remember? I mean, every Sunday, we go on to Ryan's. Now, that was just, that was the church club. Ryan's was, you had two opportunities on Sunday to show off your Sunday outfit. Only two. God gave you two. Offering. You go up there, touch the plate, (laughs) and had no money. Blessing in Jesus' name. <laughs> Offering and Ryan's. Ryan's was popping. Oh, you! It was the way it. It's, it's, it was the way that the fried chicken crunched. I ain't, there's no fried chicken like Ryan's fried chicken. It was the way the the roll, the dinner roll. Just you just you didn't really have to dip it in butter, but just because it was there, you just an uh, extra. The peach cobbler. It was warm. You put just a little ice cream on top of it. Fancy. Her brother used to be walking with four places. <laughs> Ryan's was popping. And the way we grew up, the way I grew up, I don't know. We, we did restaurants. We did buffets a little different. Some of y'all were bougie, <clears throat> Dr. Jackie. But, but the way I grew up, the way I grew up, the way, the way I grew up, you didn't eat until you were full. You ate until mama felt like she got her money's worth. <laughs> you came back, mm, that was good. What was good? <laughs> I want to get three more plates. <laughs> One plate, that was good. Yeah, I didn't know. I thought everybody did that until I got married. <laughs> mama was like, I want to go to Ryan's. I was like, oh, we're going to go to Ryan's, we're going to go to Grimes. You know, I, mean, I want balling, so if we're going to go, we're going to go. This girl came back with one leg <laughs> and some corn and macaroni mixed together. And she got a nerve to look at me, Jonathan, and say, I'm finished. You what? <laughs> that plate was made for Judah. You not finished. That, listen. They charge you like an adult. You need to eat like an adult. That thing costs $22.73, and you got sweet tea. You're not finished. 
Mm, that was good. No, ma'am, we got to get our money's worth. Digest. Sit there, let it digest, then go back when you get hungry. <laughs> and buffets make their money off of people like Dr. Jackie. They love people like her. Because they're going to charge you as if you're going to eat a lot. Knowing that you're just going to eat a little. And you see advertisement, limitless pancakes. We're going to IHOP. And you eat two of them, you fool. <laughs> Unlimited wings, and you just, ooh, bucketless wings. I'm just going to eat it, uh, and they know you're only going to get one or maybe two plates full. That's how buffets make their money. And the reality of our faith is that most people don't take advantage of the limitlessness provided of our God. Oh, my God. I know it's true. We don't take advantage of the buffet that's within our reach and already paid for. So Adam, 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 you have been planted in a prepared place with limited, with unlimited options. And yet your eyes are locked on the one thing that's limited. Oh, it sounds like us. You ever read about Adam, you wanted to punch him in the forehead? But really, you, you should punch yourself. Don't do it. But... We do the exact same thing. <laughs> limitless joy within our reach. But I'm going to choose to fix my eyes on the one limited thing that keeps depressing me. Oh. I'm going to keep choosing the limited relationship, the, the, the limited uh, uh, occupation, the, limit, the limited dream, the limited goals. I'm going to keep trying to limit a God who is limitless. And I'm going to try to limit him, watch this, not only on my experience, but sometimes even on my religion. <laughs> Surely God can't use me. So now we've been conditioned to have limited expectation and limited faith when, when the buffet is wide open for us. Somebody shout that at me. The buffet is open. The buffet is open. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, you got to catch this. He said, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, here's where, where it gets interesting because the enemy always tries to come back around and tell you, a limited truth. So the enemy says, oh, you won't surely die. He says, come on, man, you're not, you're not going to die. It's a limited truth because Adam didn't die immediately. But something in Adam died immediately. Ooh. A death occurred that day. Adam died to the original intent in which he was created for. He died him from having dominion. And he didn't even know it. And that's just what sin would do to you. Let me talk to Brianna camera real quick. That's just what sin would do to you. Because sometimes immediately you don't feel the effects of it. <laughs> well, I mean, it felt good and Everything looks the same. All the while, there are things inside of you that's being contaminated, corrupted, and dying a slow death every time you choose something limited that God said is not for you. And so now the uninterrupted access to the presence of God had been interrupted. Sin is now in the equation, and only one person can set the record straight. You search throughout Scripture, it's amazing. It's a big Bible, 66 chapters, 1,189, I mean, 66 books, 1,189 chapters. There's a lot of words in the Bible. There's a lot of content in the Bible. And, and all of the Old Testament, there's so many great people. I mean, we got heroes of faith. We got Abraham. We got Moses. We got Elijah. My God, Elisha. Uh, we got Isaiah. We got Jeremiah, Ezekiel. We got uh, all of the prophets. Um, and we got all of these amazing people, not just men, but even amazing women of God, Naomi and Ruth and Esther. I mean, there's a lot of weight in the Old Testament. And though they did many great things, none of them were perfect enough to redeem mankind. So through Adam... We all sin. We forfeited our right. 
We forfeited our dominion from the first Adam. The Bible, Paul, talks about a second Adam. And he had to come to right the wrong. And this is what Resurrection Sunday is all about. It's about rectifying. It's about redeeming. It's about reversing what the enemy thought would be for our demise. I think one of the saddest passages in the Bible occurs. Can you imagine this? And I wanted to take my time to set up Adam's domain, this place of Eden, the presence of God, the open door of heaven, and a garden in it of unlimited resources. It's beautiful because God is there. There's peace because God is there. There's love because God is there. There's joy because God is there. And I think one of the saddest passages in the Bible, it's heartbreaking, is reading about Adam and Eve getting escorted out of Eden. Leaving all that they know to be home. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, it says in, in verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. I mean, even there we see the love of God. He didn't have to clothe them. He didn't have to cover them. Verse 22, and the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Verse 23, oh, he said in verse 22, Excuse me, you can go back, I'm sorry. He said, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever, right? So he says, he says, he's become like us and now we gotta make sure that he don't have unlimited access to a tree of life where mankind was supposed to live forever because there was something called the tree of life. Verse 23, so the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove out the man, he placed, placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden, a cherubim, this is an angel, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Man, can you imagine, can you imagine being escorted out of your home, out of your neighborhood, out of your city, out of your state, never to return again, out of your country, never to return Again, but the beauty of God's grace, his amazing grace, his limitless grace, is that even after this tragedy, he immediately started making a way. <laughs> even when we fail, he immediately starts making a way. Oh, my God. Because you thought, you thought you were disqualified because of your habit, because of your default. Because of your past. Can I tell you something? God didn't start making a way when you got delivered. The reason you got delivered is because God decided to step in and make, because God the creator decided to get his hands dirty again. Because God got involved with the conflict and said, yo, I'm going to make a way. So in his infinite wisdom and I'm fell in love, he immediately starts activating this plan of salvation, of redemption. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, that God covers Adam and Eve with garments of skin. Well, how do you get garments of skin? Something dying. So this is symbolism. He's showing us right here that the only way to even cover sin, carnality, flesh, is by the blood of something. Only blood can cover Ooh, I don't want to get stuck here, Tristan, but I feel just a little old school Jesus. Because something convinced you that you can cover yourself. Something convinced you that, that, that maybe, just maybe, if you, if you dot every I and you cross every T, you can cover yourself. But you can't cover yourself. Only blood can cover you. That's why we sum that it's rewriting my history and it covers me with destiny and it's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ, it speaks on my behalf. It speaks a better word. It's his blood that redeems us. It's his blood that rescues us. It's his blood that changes us. Watch this. It's his blood that gives us access. Oh my God. You would have been destroyed, but every time he looks, he sees blood. My God. God, I just need a few people who don't mind lifting your hand and saying, God, thank you for your, oh, precious is that flow. That makes me white as 
No. No other fountain I know. It's the blood that saves, that changes, that helps, that covers. It's the only thing strong enough to deal with sin. So God comes in the form of a man. Because all throughout the Old Testament, they would slay animals to cover sin. <laughs> but it was a temporary fix. It was only a substitute. It wasn't the real thing. And God saw a guy named Travis who wouldn't need a substitute. God saw a girl named Jackie who wouldn't need a substitute. God saw a girl named Keisha who wouldn't need a substitute. God saw a girl named Micah, a guy named Reggie, a guy named LT, a guy named Jonathan. He saw you all over the world, and he said, you know what? You're going to need a little more than a substitute. He said, so I'm going to send the real thing, and the only thing real enough to cover you is me. So God comes in the form of a man and a virgin named Mary. And he lives 33 years without sin. Boy, it's tough to live 33 minutes without sin. And this Jesus, he's a nice guy. He's a radical preacher. I mean, he steps on toes and he's totally unapologetic about his purpose and his identity. And Jesus, he speaks about this kingdom often. And the fact that he's this king in this kingdom. And because his language is so bold, it is, it is uh, not only terrifying, but it, is, it threatens the political and the religious system of that day to the point that he's placed on trial. Come on. And then he's whipped. And he's nailed to a cross. And after hours of excruciating pain and humiliation, he finally dies. Naked, he dies. Providing us with a cover. He disrobes himself so we could be made whole, breaks open himself so that we can live. He dies. The sun refused to shine. The sun is like, how can I shine when the one who spoke me into existence, the light of the world is, is no more. And the ground begins to shake and it says, how can I be stable when the solid rock and the one who spoke me into existence is no more. And the whole earth stands still. <laughs> because how can we just operate? When the, one, the veil is torn because how can a temple stand when the real temple has been destroyed? Darkness is everywhere. It's the darkest day in history. It's a low point. But Christian, no one stop to think that maybe this was his plan all along. Hmm. Oh, you thought because your life was dark that he wasn't working. <laughs> you, you thought because you were weeping that he wasn't working. You thought because everyone else left you, he wasn't working. You thought because you messed up, he wasn't working. No, 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 no. My God works in the dark. Woo! Woo! Darkness is not a time to hang your head. Darkness is not a time to retreat. Darkness is not a time to say, oh, it must be over. Darkness is a time to lift up your head. Oh, ye gates and be ye lifted up. You got to get your confidence in the dark because my God works in the dark. Don't stop believing, even in the dark. It's dark outside. Jesus was still up to something. Well, what was he up to, Travis? I'm glad you asked. Just my hypothesis. <laughs> I think he was up to fulfilling promises. They forgot what he said in John chapter 14. He says, hey, 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 boys, let me talk to you. He said, Peter, James, John. I need y'all to listen up. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You believe in God, right? Yeah. He says, well, believe also in me. 
My father's house has many rooms. He's talking about home. He says, my father's house has many rooms. That were not so what I have told you. What I've told you that I'm going to prepare. Here it is again. He prepares a place before he plants you there. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back. It's dark, but I'll come back. It's lonely, but I'll come back. It's cold right now, but I'll come back. You may be confused, but I'm coming back. You may not understand what's happening around you, but I'm coming back. I'm working in the dark to prepare something for you. I'll come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. And he says, you know the way to the place where I am going. One of the disciples, if you keep reading, he spoke up. He was like, how are we supposed to know where you're going? He said, you know me, right? He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. So here's Jesus. He lives sinless for 33 years. He did miracles for three of those years. But Jesus was always on his way back home. So something happens. I'm almost done. It's the night of the betrayal. And then Jesus is praying. And he's praying so hard, the Bible says, that his sweat is as thick as blood. And he's praying. And he's crying out. Because reality is setting in. <laughs> you know, sometimes you can be busy doing things that it can take your mind off of what's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was healing. <laughs> and he was doing miracles. And he was feeding people. But now this was the dark night. And he gets down with Denar and he says, yo, if there's another way, <laughs> if, there, if there are other options, can we talk about it? <laughs> and the father says nothing. Whenever God doesn't speak, it's because he already spoke. Is, is there another way? He says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Hmm. Hmm. Jesus is the image and the likeness of God. He proved in his whole life that he had dominion. So in the likeness of God, even Jesus has to make a decision. During this prayer moment, Liz, Jesus' will is present. And the Father's will is present. And my will is if there's another way. But nevertheless, not my will but your will be done. And it happens in Gethsemane. Wait a minute. It happens in the garden of Gethsemane. The first Adam chose his will in the garden. And here's the second Adam. And he said, my brother Adam messed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm going to come into the garden. Come on. Come on. I'm not going to choose my way, Mr. LT. But even if it costs me everything, not my will for yours be done. Not my will for yours be done. Now watch what happens. The second Adam is taken out of the garden. <laughs> Saddest day in history. 
when man loses his place, loses his dominion, and is escorted out of the garden. Okay. Something interesting happens. I see my friend Jason in the back. Something interesting happens. The second Adam, Jesus, raises to life from the dead. You know the story. Hey, don't miss what happened in John 20 when Mary Magdalene turned around. The Bible says she mistakes him for a gardener. Now, Tony, I always thought this was insulting. You know, we read about this in Sunday school. How dare this, you know what Jesus has done for you? We ain't even got to talk about the cross. We ain't even got to talk about the tomb. Let's talk about your life, Mary. We know how jacked up. Mary Magdalene, we know your story. Hey, you misplaced him for a gardener? How insensitive. How insulting. And it wasn't until recently that it dawned on me. A gardener. That's who the first Adam was supposed to be. The Bible says the Lord God took man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And so here's Jesus. And he says all that the first Adam felt to do and all that the first Adam felt to be, here I come to take care of it. I, I'm coming to take care of it. I'm, behold, all things are made new. So Jesus, now the story makes sense. He left his home in glory to take a bloody, humiliating journey back home so that you and I could find our back home. Where's home? In the presence of God. An angel had a sword with fire. He was keeping, making sure y'all ain't getting back to this tree of life. Isn't it interesting that Mary runs into two angels and says, why are you crying? Once an angel was keeping them away from life, and now two angels are inviting them to life. The Jesus that you're searching for, he's alive. He tried to tell us, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. He said, I am life. And I've come that you may have life and life more abundantly. John 4, you're searching for water in the wrong place. I am the well that never runs dry. You're searching for fruit in the wrong place. I am the tree of life. I am the hope of the future. I am the prince of peace. Everything you need, I am. Moses, who can I tell him sent me? I am that I am. The one who defeated hell in the grave. He says, hey, the buffet is open. And I am the one who supplies you with limitless mercy. What's mercy? Mercy means I didn't get what I deserve. Uh, it means that, that it was on the way, Roberta, but he blocked it. He, 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 it means that he took my destruction. Mm. He bore my weight. chastisement of my peace was upon him. I didn't get the rejection I deserve. I didn't get the eternal separation I deserve. I didn't get the destruction I deserve. That's mercy. But not only does the buffet give me mercy, but the buffet gives me boundless grace. Hey, mercy means I didn't get what I deserve. Hey, Chris, Grace means I got what I didn't deserve. I got freedom that I didn't deserve. I got joy that I didn't deserve. I got hope that I didn't deserve. I got peace that I didn't deserve. I got a right mind that I didn't deserve. I got access that I don't deserve. I got a future because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know who holds my future.
I got what I don't deserve. It's a buffet. Endless love. A buffet. Immeasurable joy. A buffet. Unending goodness and mercy. The buffet is open. And once again, the tree of life is accessible. Nothing blocking me. Maybe this is why, I don't want to go too far, but maybe this is why in the Old Testament when they went behind the veil, many died. Because something was keeping them from the presence. Jesus said, but I've come, I've Settled it once and for all. Just this picture. If the cross is too much to see, see this. Jesus standing at the door of Ryan's. <laughs> and every nation, tribe, and tongue behind him. He opens the door. He says, if you want to get in here, come through me. And he walks up. The Father God, the cashier. And he says, I'm paying for all of them. Yeah. What about what about the one in the back who who messed up on their way here? Uh-oh. Covered. Man. What about the, the thief on the cross next to you? that lived like hell his whole life, but in his final second said, remember me. I covered him. What, what about the adulterer that, that was caught in the act? Said, I took the target so they could stone me instead. What about Barabbas? A serial killer. He can be free. I'll take it. I always thought it was interesting that he frees Barabbas. <laughs> I mean, I think it would have been easier if it was somebody, you know, just somebody who had a speeding ticket or got caught with, you know, a bag. Nah, this is, this is a murderer. And I think he did that to demonstrate something to us. That I am God enough to get my hands dirty with the worst of the worst. You don't know what I did. He does and he still paid for it. But he didn't pay for it with the visa, with American Express, with a MasterCard. He paid for it with blood. He took the bill and the receipt is signed in blood. Oh, precious is that flow. That makes me white as snow. No other help I know. Nothing but the blood of... The buffet is open. <laughs> Life is available. Freedom is available. It's rewriting my history. It covered me with destiny. Making all things right. The precious blood of Christ is rewriting my history. And it covers me with destiny. Making all things right. Hey. He did all of this so that we can find our way back home. <laughs> There's another story you may have heard of. The prodigal son. The story that Jesus told. And what happens is that this prodigal son 
He asks for his inheritance and he goes and he splurges all of his money. He, he runs up all his cards and kills his credit and just make a mess of his life. The Bible says he's come to himself when he's eating with pigs and goes back home. The father's waiting on the porch because he sees him afar off and runs to him, covers him once again, gives him a ring and some new sandals so that he doesn't have to bring his past into his future. Gives him dominion and a covering. He makes a feast for him because the buffet is open. When they party. You know that story, but there's another part to the story. And it's the older brother. And the older brother <laughs> is a little upset. You know, he's a little religious. And he says, he says, Dad, I got a problem. How dare you throw him a party? I've been here, I've been faithful, I've been consistent, I've been celibate, I've been living for you, I've been serving, I've been giving. Come on, come on. Hey, you ain't give me nothing. And the father changes the narrative. He says, son, I didn't have to throw you a party because the party is always available. The buffet is always open. Unlimited resources around you. I was thinking about this story Dr. Jackie and thought about Jesus. I always, when I thought about Jesus, I thought about him in the role of the father, right? That's how, you know, the father waits for the son. There's another role. Jesus is the better older brother. Instead of hanging at the crib and judging us, he said, hey, dad, I'm going to leave home. And I'm going to get dirty. And I'll get down here with the pigs. And he said, Travis, you, you, you go back home. I'm going to switch places with you so that you can find your way back home. <laughs> hey, the only reason you're watching online today and the only reason you're in this room worshiping is because our older brother left the house. He left the house and he put on rags and he he just robed himself from glory and put on flesh and and he came as a filthy dirty man he didn't just get his hands dirty he became dirty so that we can have access to a buffet that we don't deserve he paid it all all to Jesus I owe it left the stain, he washed it as snow. When I could not pay, he covered it. Hallelujah to the one who paid it all. He paid it all, and all to Jesus I owe. It left the stain, he washed it as snow. And when I could not pay, he covered it. Hallelujah, Hallelujah to the one who paid it. Oh, he paid it all. Oh, to Jesus I owe. Then left the same. He washed it as snow. And when, when I, I could, could not pay, he covered it. When I could not pay, he covered it. When I could not pay.
Hey guys, you may be watching online or you may even be in this room. The buffet is open. Come on, come on. All ye who are weary and heavy laden, come to Jesus. He'll give you rest. Come on, you may even be in this room. He's for you. He's with you. He's a God who paid it all. The buffet is open. The buffet is open. The buffet. Hallelujah. Come on. To the one who paid. Hallelujah. Say to the one Come on. who paid. Hallelujah. from the Jesus but today he's been calling your name so that you can find your way back home I want to pray with you repeat after me all over the world Lord Jesus I believe you died on the cross for my sins and I believe that you got up so I don't have to stay down the buffet is open and I'm coming home I give you my life I give you my heart all that I am belong to you and to you alone. My life is not my own. In Jesus' name, amen. You got one minute. Give him a good praise. Hey, we pray that this week's message was truly transformative for your life. We thank you so much for joining us and we want you to stay connected. Even if you would like to give, all that information is down below. Absolutely, there's no gift too small mm -hmm. or too big. I'm gonna tell you the greatest gift is if you receive mm -hmm. his gift of salvation for you. Maybe you're lost or maybe you're down and you just needed hope. This is the right place to provide that for you. Mm -hmm. And I know you might spell hope H-O-P-E, <laughs> but I spell hope J-E-S-U-S. -E yes! He is our friend, he is our father, mm -hmm. he is for you, he's mm -hmm. not against you. I would love to pray with you before you leave today. Mm -hmm. Would you please bow your head with me, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for our family. Thank you. Thank you for this moment in time that we've had together that was on your schedule. Mm -hmm. This was an appointment, a divine appointment that the Father had with his children, and I pray that you would just bring calm to their heart, yes, that Lord. you would bring peace where there is confusion, that mm -hmm. you would bring joy where there is depression. You are our God, you are our friend, you are our Father. All of this is for you. You mm -hmm. get the credit for anyone who's lost. Remind them yes, Lord. that you love them and you're for them. In Jesus' name, amen. We amen. love you. We'll see you next week.